SpaceX successfully launched two batches of Starlink Internet satellites into orbit on Falcon 9 rockets. The first of those missions lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida on February 21, adding 46 new spacecraft to its ever-growing Internet constellation. This mission, Starlink Group 48, marked SpaceX's seventh launch of 2022, averaging a launch every 7.2 days so far, keeping the company on pace for 52 launches this year. The rocket's first stage completed its 11th flight, landing on a drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean a few hundred kilometers off the Florida coast. It was the 100th Falcon 9 rocket landing for SpaceX and its 107th landing overall, including touchdowns by Falcon Heavy boosters. Monday's launch was the first launch since a February 3 mission that placed 49 Starlink satellites into orbit. However, 38 of them re-entered into the Earth's atmosphere because of a solar storm that increased atmospheric drag at the low altitudes the satellites were placed into. Learning from the anomaly that happened on its previous mission, SpaceX adopted a different approach to Monday's mission. The previous launch deployed the satellites after a single burn of the upper stage, placing the satellites into orbit with a perigee of 210 kilometers. This flight conducted a second burn to put the satellites into a near-circular orbit at an altitude of about 330 kilometers. The higher altitude reduces the atmospheric drag, but may also explain why this launch carried three fewer satellites than recent missions. The onboard ion propulsion system on the satellites is expected to raise their altitudes to about 540 kilometers over the coming weeks and months. The second launch of the week took place on February 25. A Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California on Friday, carrying 50 Starlink satellites into a polar orbit. The B-1063 booster used for this mission has flown three previous missions, including the Sentinel-6 Michael Fralick and DART missions. SpaceX has launched more than 2,000 Starlink satellites to date, and many more are slated to go up. The next SpaceX Starlink mission, Group 49, is set to launch from Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A on Thursday, March 3. Rocket Lab announced on Wednesday the completion of its second orbital launch pad at Launch Complex 1 in New Zealand. Hello and welcome to Launch Complex 1 in the beautiful Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand, the only private orbital launch site in the entire world. So just behind me here is our newest addition, Pad B. The new pad, Launch Complex 1B, is Rocket Lab's third for the company's Electron launch vehicle and joins the existing Pad A at Launch Complex 1 and another launch pad at Rocket Lab Launch Complex 2 in Virginia, USA. Alongside Pad A, the new addition will double Electron's launch capability and eliminate pad recycle time, ensuring a launch pad is always available for a rapid response mission. Moreover, when paired with Rocket Lab's North American launch site, the company can support a total of 132 launch opportunities a year. More than 50 local construction workers and contractors were involved in the development of Launch Complex 1B, which includes a 66-ton launch platform and a 7.6-ton strongback customized to the Electron launch vehicle. Launch Pad B shares infrastructure with Pad A, including three satellite cleanrooms, a launch vehicle assembly hangar, and administrative offices. Rocket Lab plans to conduct the first launch from Launch Complex 1B next week. The mission, dubbed the Owl's Night Continues, will carry the first of three dedicated missions for Synspective, a geospatial data collector from Japan. Liftoff is currently scheduled for no earlier than February 28 UTC, and the company will not be attempting to recover Electron for this mission. Space Logistics, a satellite servicing firm owned by Northrop Grumman, announced its plans to send to orbit a new servicing vehicle in 2024 on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. This will be the debut of the company's mission robotic vehicle, a servicing spacecraft equipped with a robotic arm that will install propulsion jetpacks on dying satellites. According to Space Logistics, the MRV was built with many of the same technologies used in the company's mission extension vehicles. Mission extension vehicles are designed to dock to geostationary satellites whose fuel is nearly depleted. Once connected to its client satellite, MEV uses its own thrusters and fuel supply to extend the satellite's lifetime. When the customer no longer desires MEV's service, the spacecraft will undock and move on to the next client satellite. The Mission Extension Vehicle 1, the industry's first satellite life extension vehicle, completed its first docking to a client satellite, Intelsat IS-901, on 25 February 2020. The second mission extension vehicle launched on 15 August 2020, docked with the Intel SAT-IS-1002 satellite on 12 April 2021. 
During the 2024 Mission Robotic Vehicle Deployment, Space Logistics plans to demonstrate how its robotic vehicle can install the mission extension pods on commercial satellites with its robotic arms. The MRV and three propulsion jet packs known as Mission Extension Pods are now being assembled at Northrop Grumman's facility in Virginia. All three pods, each about 400 kilograms, will be launched with the Mission Robotic Vehicle, a 3,000-kilogram spacecraft. Once in orbit, each pod is captured by the MRV and stowed for transport to the client satellite. The MRV rendezvous and docks with the client to install the pod, which operates like an auxiliary propulsion device and uses its own thrusters to maneuver the client vehicle. Then the MRV detaches itself and moves on to grab another MEP for the next customer. The entire sequence of operation requires two rendezvous and docking maneuvers per satellite instead of one, and it's unclear why that added complexity is preferable over the obvious alternative, in which MRV would launch with a number of MEPs, carry them to GEO, and install them when needed. The mission robotic vehicle is designed to stay in orbit for 10 years, while mission extension pods are designed to extend the service life of a 2,000-kilogram satellite by six years. The first customer for the MRV is Optus, Australia's largest satellite operator. One of the pods that will be launched in 2024 will be installed on an Optus satellite, and the other two are for other customers that have not yet been announced. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has agreed to send a retired SpaceX Starship prototype to a Texas airport for public display after making an offer for the same. Musk's offer had followed a Twitter user's suggestion for a public rocket garden for fans. He suggested that it may be established on or near Brownsville South Padre Island International Airport, a central location for the Brownsville and South Padre residents near Starbase. The Twitter account for Brownsville South Padre International Airport replied that the prototype would sit best at the airport, and Musk agreed to send one over at this place. The location is ideal for displaying a Starship because a street in front of the airport is named Starship Road. At Starbase, multiple Starship prototypes can be seen on display at a place nicknamed Rocket Garden. Starships currently parked at the Rocket Garden are Starship Serial No. 15, Serial No. 16, and Starship S-22. Starship SN-15 is the first Starship prototype to fly to a moderate altitude and survive a soft landing in May 2021. Musk once stated that the historic prototype would be reused on a second flight test, but the ship was never used and has since sat at Starbase's rocket garden. Starship SN-16, which is nearly identical to SN-15, was also supposed to fly but never got a single test before being retired to the same garden. Finally, last week, after installing its nose cone and four flaps, SpaceX's most recent prototype, Starship 22, was sent to the same graveyard of retired prototypes, strongly implying that a two will never be used. Furthermore, Super Heavy Booster 5, which stands nearly 70 meters tall, was sent directly to the garden without even attempting to complete or test the rocket. Its sister booster, Super Heavy Booster 4, which was supposed to support Starship's first orbital launch attempt, will most likely meet its end alongside Booster 5 later this year. Moreover, its companion, Starship 20, may also end up at the Rocket Garden. The ships and boosters cannot stay at the build site indefinitely because they take up space. As a result, SpaceX's ever-growing stock of retired or fully unused Starship and Super Heavy hardware provides the company with numerous options for donating one or more prototypes. The South Texas region has seen tourism increase due to SpaceX spaceflight activities. The chance to witness a rocket close-up is drawing tourists from around the world to this remote stretch of the Texas coast. Displaying a starship in front of the Brownsville South Padre Island International Airport is an excellent way to welcome visitors to South Padre and Starbase. Now, let's move on to updates from Starbase. Booster 4 and Ship 20 went through a series of cryo-proof tests since the last update. The first of these occurred on February 18, when the booster underwent its third cryo-proof test since December 17. Ship 22 was subjected to its fifth cryo-proof test four days later. We can expect more proof tests of ship and booster in the coming days. SpaceX's rocket catching and stacking arm, which was last activated to de-stack Ship 20 from Booster 4 was actuated again on February 18. This time the arms moved to the top of the integration tower and performed swing tests to verify its operations once again. As detailed in the previous video, because the authorities do not yet approve the vertical tanks initially designed to store methane, SpaceX has already built two horizontal tanks to store methane at the orbital tank farm. And because these two tanks are insufficient to hold the propellant needed for an orbital flight, SpaceX has begun the process of installing additional horizontal storage tanks. 
On February 23, two new methane storage tanks arrived at the launch site. The next day, on February 24, three more horizontal tanks arrived at Starbase. Soon the tanks will be installed at the tank farm, and they will be filled with liquid methane. Starship and booster production works are ongoing at the Starbase construction site. Super Heavy Booster 8 stacking operations have begun inside the high bay. The common dome and a four-ring section of oxygen tank were mated recently. The booster transport stand was recently moved from the launch site to the build site, most likely to assist in the stacking of Booster 7. Booster 7 will be complete once the aft dome, oxygen tank, and methane tank sections are joined. Thermal protection tile installation over the nose cone of Starship 24 is progressing inside the nose cone manufacturing tent. Beginning with Ship 24, the methane header tank will be relocated to the nose cone near the oxygen header tank. This is to counter the weight of the extended tanks and the nine Raptor engines on the future Starship prototypes. One of SpaceX's Starship offshore launch and landing platforms, Deimos, recently embarked on a voyage from the port of Brownsville to Pascagoula, Mississippi, to join its partner, Phobos. Almost all of the offshore drilling structures on Phobos were removed last year, while Deimos has seen little activity up to this point. According to Musk, one of the two platforms would have a launch tower installed by the end of the year. Uh, one of them and, and, and build at least a catch tower on it. So, uh, and, and ultimately we will, ultimately meaning like, I don't know, later this year, <laughs> um, uh, build a, a, a full launch capability um, on, um, on one of the platforms. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.